This is Issues in the News, and I'm Dorothy Doby, the president of the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians. Welcome to the first episode as we explore the many dimensions of parliamentary life and their people in public service. Why are we doing this? Well, the answer is simple. We want to show Canadians that service to your country and being a politician is an honourable occupation that should attract the best among us. And this is the best way to preserve and improve our democracy. Now, the former members we will interview all had something special to bring to the House of Commons or the Senate. They gave up their private lives and exciting occupations to do this. One of those exciting occupations was hockey. And today we have three former members who played in their early lives and aspired to make hockey a career. This early experience added something special, a special dimension to their service in the house and we will learn how today. With me is Heck Cloutier, a former Liberal member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke, Leo Duguay from the Progressive Conservative Party for, uh, was the member for St. Boniface, and Paul de Villiers. De Villiers or de Villiers? De Villiers or de Villiers. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure about that devil part. I thought I would leave that out. Former no, Liberal no, member right. for Simcoe North. So with that introduction, folks, you'll see what kind of a fun time we're going to have. <laughs> they are a bunch of devilers from what I can gather in the last few minutes. Good day, everybody. How are you? Great. I see you're all decked out in your hockey finery, except for Leo. He doesn't, you know. You couldn't make the cut. <laughs> hey, we already have a power play on him. There's Paul and I against Leo. I mean, Leo is in big trouble here up right off the bat. Well, he has a little balance on him, but he can well, handle himself. I've seen him play. He's tough in the corners. So I think, heck, I think two against one, probably fair. Well, yeah, especially right. if you're... I can't say this because I'm supposed to be the nonpartisan person here, right? I was going to say, if, if it takes one conservative and two liberals, that's, you know, pretty normal. Uh, for most uh, both, both of them know, Dorothy, that I was independent too. So, I mean, I oh, got well. a bit of an independent streak in me. I, that didn't get me very far. But anyway, <laughs> I was also independent besides being a liberal. Is that part of being a hockey player, being independent and independently minded? No. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Ho ho hockey players on my team are team players. Team players. I, I, don't, I don't need any prima donna independent people on my hockey team. Okay, so yeah, but when I I was Paul's coach and general manager, so he had to put up with me. Oh, I see. <laughs> All right. Well, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you first. Uh, we'll start with you, Heck, because you're not on my screen up in the left hand corner. I don't know why you're in the left hand corner, but there you are. I was a left winger playing <laughs> hockey. <laughs> There you see it. Yeah. Right playing politics. So so tell us a little bit about your, your hockey career. We'll start with you. Oh, well, I never had an, as an illustrious a, a career as Paul and Leo. I was just a little rink rat back here in Petawawa, Pembroke area. But I did play junior A hockey for the Pembroke Little Lumber Kings. And then I played university hockey. And um, when I got elected, we had a team. We had a couple of teams, actually. I had a team liberal and I kind of managed that. And, and I, before we go any further, Paul was our best player, best defenseman anyway. John, uh, John McKay after Frank Mahovlich was the best player because McKay played all the time. But De Villar, De Villa, the little devil, he was very, <laughs> very good. And, but anyway, uh, that's the extent of my career. We had, we had tons of fun, uh, team liberal. And then uh, that's why I had this shirt on here with, Basically, that's the House of Commons. So that was an all-party team. And in spite of what the VA says, that uh, he played on the all-party team too. And he actually made some of those Conservatives and Bloc Québécois. I remember Daniel Turp looked good. <laughs> anyway, I let the other guys go. I don't want to get put in the penalty box for talking too long. Well, I've, right. already, heard, I've already heard about you. Uh, you know, heck, I was told by Paul that you're very quiet and shy and retiring. So you yeah, better you're, you're going to have to really draw him, draw him out because he's so shy. Yeah, hey, that's what he told hey, me. The VA can't pick on me. Même coupe cheveux, Monsieur Le Chauve. See, that's why I wear the hat. I've got the same haircut as the, as the VA, but we're we're not full plumage like Duguay over here. <laughs> well, then let's 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 stay on the left here for a few more minutes and and start with, go with to you, Paul, and tell us a little bit about your hockey career. Yeah, again, like heck, nothing nothing illustrious. I uh, I came to Ottawa. I, for pre-U, so I came right from midget hockey. So I played uh, at the University of Ottawa. And then after my uh, university days, I played with the uh, Les Panthères d'Ambrun, which was a uh, 
the, the hockey in the Valley at the time, in the area at the time. I played a couple of years there. And then when I went home, I finished playing intermediate at home for the last, uh, my last three years of playing real hockey. And then I played a lot of old timers after that, which is uh, more about beer drinking than hockey, but that was a lot of fun. Okay. How about you, Leo? You had quite a long career in hockey. I did. It was actually uh, longer than I thought. I was I was initially drafted in the Toronto organization by the Winnipeg Monarchs, and uh, just to show you what hockey was like in those days, they were prepared to pay me twenty dollars a week expense money, but they didn't wow. want me to. But they didn't want me to go to university because university people were in the way. So luckily, I, I realized quickly, early enough that I wasn't good enough to go to the NHL. So I played at the university instead. I had a pretty good career there, and then played in the old Western uh, Canadian Senior League for six or seven years. Uh, I got paid to play way more than I, than I was worth. One year, um, you know, the NHL minimum salary was 6,500. And I played so many games that I made more money than some guys in the NHL. Because in <laughs> those days, senior hockey had big crowds because there were six teams. And so we had very big crowds. So I got to do something that, that I would have done for free and uh, made a little spending money on the side. So that's why I played as long as I did. Well, that's interesting because I, I read in the Paul that you were interested and you would have loved to have gone on to the NHL, that you would love to have had hockey as a career. Oh, every, every red-blooded Canadian kid, that's your, that's your goal when you're young. You wanna, you wanna be in the NHL, you wanna play NHL. But uh, unlike Leo, I didn't get paid to play in our, our uh, senior days. We used to play for the cut. And the general manager was always a crook. There was never anything left to, left to pay off. <laughs> so I played for the cut, and the cut always worked out to be nothing. So. <laughs> it's funny how that works out, isn't it? Uh, well, the, the, yes. the, Winnipeg, the Winnipeg Maroons had a similar players pool, but it was run really honestly. And, uh, you know, players would come out to practice, and somebody had a new stick, and someone would say, no, no, no. We practice with old sticks because we're trying to make a little bit of money. One yeah. year, I think with the Winnipeg Maroons, the, the players' pool was thirty-five hundred dollars. Wow, it was really quite a bit in those days. Yeah, that was. How about you, Heck? Did you get paid at all? No, actually, I think some of the coaches and managers wanted to pay me to stay off the ice instead <laughs> of being <laughs> on the ice. No, although to Paul and Leo's point about a manager, we had the, this fellow on senior hockey when I played and we played for the take and he was called 60 40 and was 60 for him 40 for us but the way it worked out I think it was 99 percent for him and one percent for us we didn't get enough to buy a hot dog but we had a lot of fun yeah so you know I mean it's like you said before Paul this is a team sport you have to learn to get along with others you have to learn to take orders from the coach etc cetera, etc cetera. what did that bring how did that inform your life as a um Member of Parliament. Well, I I came to Ottawa uh, with the hockey mentality that there, there would be one coach on the team, and he was the boss, and we'd follow we'd follow the the team discipline. I soon learned that that's not how politics works. That's that's good that's good theory in hockey, but in politics, there are too many people trying to climb that ladder so fast that the uh, the team spirit gets uh, get worn out a little bit. So uh, I I was accused of not being a self promoter enough because I wouldn't. I was always looking at what I thought was good for the the Liberal Party, which of course meant it was good for the country. Right. So uh, so I uh, but no, it was a quite an eye opener for me. It took me a little while to realize that um, I wasn't playing hockey anymore. I was playing a different game. Yeah, so then you have to learn a few other skills. What about you, Leo? How did you well, so find me, that this affected your so, career? So let, let, me pick up, let me pick up on Paul. I think uh, my experience in the Mulroney government was better. Uh, I think there were more team players, but more important than that, I think it, it shaped how I behaved. I thought uh, I played hockey and I saw winning teams. They were disciplined. You know, there was a plan and a strategy and saw quickly how you win. I played on an awful lot of losing teams and understood very quickly why they lost. 
sometimes they had good players, but they had no discipline and no strategy. They played for themselves rather than the team. So it, it, it I think it influenced my behavior. And I tried to behave uh, in politics the way I behaved in hockey. Did that give you a disadvantage, like Paul suggests, or is, or did you find a, a way to get around that? No, I, I, I learned to, I learned in hockey that I guess one of the big lessons in hockey, hockey is a lot about intimidation. People try to intimidate you so you can't do what you want to do. And you learn to deal with that. You learn to develop alliances, you know, line mates who, who help you out. You have a training staff when you're hurt that helps you get back to play. So I think you, you learn a lot about support systems and people. You learn a lot, a lot about the opposition and taking them seriously. So, and I don't think you can do a lot about what other people do, but you can do a lot about what you do. How about you, Heck? What, what, uh, how do you feel it informed your career? Well, you know, to both Leo and Paul's point, hockey, like politics, is a team affair. I mean, you got to be, you've got to go along with the team. And if you don't go along with the team, there could be repercussions. And Perhaps that's one of the reasons why I went as an in, uh, ran as an independent a few times. Um, I guess the independent streak is there, like it still was with uh, De Ville. But at the end of the day, you're far better off on any team, whether it's a hockey team or a political team. To Paul's point in particular, I think that I'm not trying to put words in his mouth. I don't believe he, he had a problem with the coach, with the boss, who was Jean Chrétien at that time. But there were some members of parliament, and I believe Leo will agree with this, who they just wanted to go from the fourth or fifth row to the first row, like a snap of your fingers. And they will do anything, some of them, not all of them, to climb right over the top of you. The VA was our uh, the national caucus chair, very talented guy, fluently bilingual lawyer, great hockey player, like I said previously, but there were some people out there who did not like that fact and they were trying to advance in the system. So as Paul said, and once again, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, I don't believe it was the, the coach, but some other people, players in the team, supposed to be the liberal team, at least with hockey, you could line the person up in the dressing room or on the ice, you just don't pass them the puck or make sure you pass it into their skates. Yeah. But in politics, that's just the way it goes. And to Leo's point, when he said the opposition, I thought when we had this team, that was the best almost because we had opposition players on it. And I could actually see the difference with the camaraderie between the, the opposition players who played on the hockey team with the Liberals. So there was Liberals, NDP, even Bloc Québécois, Danielle Turp was on there and Richard Marceau and the NDP. We there was still an, at an adversarial atmosphere in the House of Commons, but it wasn't nearly as, maybe I used the word severe, once you'd played hockey with that person. You just got to know them a little bit better. So that was a good team building in one, th in one way for the, for the House of Commons. But at the end of the day, as both these gentlemen said, it's still a team and you've got to go along with the team. Yeah. You may not like it sometimes, but that's well, the way it goes. What I wish we could have done with some of the people who weren't team players, when we had when we had that in hockey, somebody misbehaved. Mm. They had to come to practice and they had to scrimmage. Yes. So exactly. we got our we got our chance to set them straight in scrimmage. Uh, in politics, you couldn't do that. And uh, and you know, let's let's be frank. The years I was there, there were there were two camps. There was the the official liberal team that Jean Chrétien was the leader of, and there was the Paul Martin team that was uh, always working against the team. Mm. And it's, it's the sad fact, and that's how it was. And I was uh, penalized for being a Chrétien guy. Well, I, went, I got there, he was my, our elected leader. So he was the guy I was going to follow. There was, you know, there was no question. But um, when the Martin gang took over, then I was in the penalty box. So it's a complicated, it's a complicated balancing of, of personalities in Parliament, isn't it? Because I, I, I'm reminded from what you're saying of Churchill's maiden speech when he said, I'm very familiar with this place over there, um, Mr. Speaker, is the opposition and over here is the enemy. That kind mm -hmm. of uh, thinking 
how do you overcome that? And how do you, is there, are the rules from the hockey game aside from the, scrim, the scrimmage thing that uh, you can do to, uh, to, you know, subtly shift the way things go, Leo? So just, uh, just two things. Um, I think I was lucky because in the nearly mm -hmm. 10 years of the Mulroney government, there was not one iota of challenge to his leadership. Oh, that's not right. one. Uh, yes. Internally, sometimes even when we were very bad at the polls, everybody was, was following Mulroney. Largely, I think his skill in uniting people together was, was very, very good. So I, I get that. But I, in terms of, of getting people to be straightened out, um, I think I, I learned something in hockey. Uh, I was a coach as well as a player in my latter years. And I used to say to people, look, while the game is on, just shut up and play the game. Mm -hmm. Between games, if you want to come into my office and have a chat with me about who should be on the power play, whether you're getting enough ice time or whatever, we can do that. But during the game, shut up. And I found the same thing in our caucus, in the Mulroney caucus. There were some drag them out fights in caucus. And I, I think I learned that. I got along really well because I could say whatever I wanted in caucus. I remember one day I made a long address about Canada Post and the union stuff, only to find out that that was going to be on the order paper today. So I buzzed off and flew home to Winnipeg and stayed out of the way. And the following Monday, I ran into the prime minister and he said, nice going, Leo, because he appreciated the fact that I had fought my battle inside caucus and outside knew enough to keep my mouth shut. So mm -hmm. I think that's the moral. Inside the caucus, you can do whatever you want. But Dorothy, to your point about the opposition and the enemy, I know when I was first elected, one of the li older liberal members that had been around a while said, look, Rook, uh, the opposition sit across the aisle from you, the enemy sit behind you. Yeah. yeah. Bear that in mind. <laughs> so there is competition within a caucus to to reach uh, you know certain achievements i mean trips are one of the things that if you don't make it to the front benches people argue or try to find ways to uh, get favors to do you know special uh, special assignments i guess i could say but at the end of the day like you say leo it's get on the team or walk and sometimes people walk what happens guys you mean dorothy they they walked out they of caucus yeah yeah well in, in most instances no, they didn't really, they walked out, but it wasn't really of their own volition. Some of them just, well, most of them just get thrown out of caucus because they're such a pain in the butt or they won't go along with the team or they make an egregious comment that they shouldn't make. But generally speaking, I agree with both the gentlemen. I mean, it's a team, you have to management. Leo did have the luxury of having the one prime minister. There was no one barking at right behind him trying to take over. Uh, Paul is right on the money. We had a contend and after I no longer was a member of parliament, I was a special advisor to the prime minister for caucus. Well, that was like herding cats, as Paul would know, because you had the Merton faction there and you had the Kretzia loyalists and Paul's right. You support the prime minister for goodness sakes. All the man did was win three majority elections. I know that there could be a reason for it, but he won three majority elections. Follow the leader. Instead, no, they were sniping. And as I said, and Paul will agree with me, the Merton people were very, very good at blowing up bridges, but they couldn't build one. So is, is that was, a bad what? thing though, guys? I mean, I sound very serious when we're talking about parliament and what happens today. Is it bad for people to have disagreements within their team? Because they are going to happen over Paul. Yeah, Leo said. As long as, yeah, as long as the disagreements, as Leo said, stay within caucus yeah. and don't and don't become uh, fodder for the opposition or the other parties to to use against the team that that you're that you're playing on. So it's uh, and it, and I think maybe you were alluding, Dorothy, to people who cross the floor and join another party when they're not happy with what's going on, which happens from time to time. Yeah, and I I was approached when it was became apparent that I was in the uh, the Martin penalty box because I was the only rural MP elected for the by for the Liberals in the 2004 election the one election I ran I ran under the Martin there was another liberal rural liberal who survived that 
And uh, when it became obvious that that even that didn't put me in any kind of standing with the uh, with the prime minister, uh, I was approached by the executive director of the Green Party cross the floor and become the first Green Party MP, which sounded had you know was sort of intriguing, but uh, I I don't believe in crossing the floor. No one in Simcoe North had voted for me as a Green Party member, and I you know I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't do that. Plus, I had I had friends that were still on the on the ice under the Liberal banner that I had been with for 13 years. I wasn't going to you know mess up any relationships that they might have with their constituents by saying, oh, "Here, Liberals are becoming Greens, and it's all going to hell in a handbasket." So, I I wouldn't have any part of it. But do you regret? Do you regret any of you regret any of those days, even when you went through the the awkward times and the difficult times and there are many, I mean, it, you give your entire life to this funny business you're suddenly thrust into. Any, any regrets, anybody? Well, I don't, Dorothy. I went through the CF-18 um, in Western Canada and Winnipeg. I mean, the, the week the CF-18 was announced, we were down to 11% in Manitoba. <laughs> but, but it, you know, I, I always took the view that it's a long game and this was an individual issue. And it would it would go, but you know I, I always took the view that if my party did ten things and I disagreed with one, well maybe there was a chance I might be wrong. Yeah. The same thing as in hockey, you know, if the coach, the players all want to do a certain thing and you disagree, there's a chance you're wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, Which is and, you know it, it, whenever I lost and not very many people get into politics and win, 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 like the VA. But anyway, uh, when I lost, it was over a very controversial issue. And just what Leo was speaking about the CF-18, well, his CF-18 was my gun registration because I was one of the rural members of parliament in a hunting area, farmers, very rural, like Paul's. Yeah. And I told the sitting prime minister at that time, I contacted him a couple of weeks before the actual voting day. And I said, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm going to lose this election. He said, no, no, Ector, the people really like you. I said, you know what? They may like me, but they're voting against me, but I'm staying with the team. And I did. And I'm not saying that's 100% cause, but probably 95% cause, because that was the only focal issue in that campaign in the fall of 2000. And the voting day was in November, which coincided with hunting season. So, you know, but you take it for the team. It's the same as anything else. There's an aphorism in life, take one for the team. So I took one for the team. And, and I firmly believe that's why the prime minister asked me after, subsequent to that election to come and work in the prime minister's office and deal with caucus. And, and that's just the way things roll along. But mm -hmm. that, that's it. Sometimes you have to do things like that because as Leo said, you might think that you're right once, once out of 10, but at the end of the day, it still is a team like a hockey team. I mean, you may disagree with the coach, and but if you keep on disagreeing with him, you're going to be in the black sheep squadron or sitting at the end of the bench like mm -hmm. Eddie Shack did one time and take his skates off and punch him like to get on the ice. And he's going to have to put my skates back on because he had benched him for two periods. Anyway, so, that's... Dor so Dorothy, on that point, I have a, an interesting kind of story. Harley Hotchkiss was one of the senior owners of the Calgary Flames. And sure. uh, when I worked for Joe Clark, occasionally we were in Calgary and were invited to the games. So I got to know Harley reasonably well. And one day the Calgary had a coach who wasn't really all that nice a person, but the Flames were winning. And I remember one day he said to me, you know, pretty hard to fire a coach when he's winning. But I want to tell you, if he ever starts to lose, you won't be there more than two minutes. And, uh, you know, this is exactly what happened. When yeah. the club started to lose, the coach was gone. So, you know, this hex right. It's a team game. And if you don't play according to team rules, things are not going to work out for you eventually, and they're never going to work out for your team. And, and that's, that's a really good lesson, I think, for people who are watching, because I think they sometimes wonder what they call dishonesty is really just making some 
practical decisions about how you keep that team moving ahead. The team wants, the team knows how that uh, it has a direction it wants to follow and it has to follow that direction. And you can't have 15 leaders because you'll be going all over the place. Would that be accurate? Okay. Yeah, and back to, back to the question about regret regrets, uh, Dorothy. I have I have no regrets. I uh, I went from uh, practicing law in small town practice, uh, very limited number of people I contacted, and then when I was elected, I got to Ottawa, met people all over the country, traveled the country extensively with different committees at different times, became sex state for sport, traveled internationally, and uh, really broadened my my experiences mm. tremendously so we sure you have some internal stuff that you're maybe not that all that pleased with but to one point when uh, the point that Hector made when he he took one for the team and became the caucus liaison I was a chair of caucus at the time and the prime minister called me and said oh Hector, I'm going to appoint Hector to uh, to be my caucus liaison do you think you know how will caucus take that I said, well, there's some in caucus who aren't going to be too too uh, too fussy about that because Hector didn't always get along with everyone. But I said, you got to do it because he owns the hockey sweaters, and that's, we, have, <laughs> we have to keep the hockey team going. So, so Dorothy, I'm going to jump in on that point. You know, we always talk about the person in caucus who disagrees. Well, I have a really good example. There was a thing coming up with Canada Post that I really didn't like it. It was a union matter and I had a little experience with unions. So I phoned the caucus chairs. I, I chaired Manitoba caucus, phoned the BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Quebec and Ontario caucus chairs and one person in the Maritimes and said, you know, I think this is a dumb idea. So on Wednesday at caucus, I'm going to stand up and say it's a dumb idea. Well, lo and behold, I stand up at caucus, say it's a dumb idea, and I'm followed by nine caucus chairs in a row agreeing with me. And the prime minister in summing up says, I think you, you've made a point, we're gonna pull back. So I think you're not always by yourself and there is a vehicle to oppose, it's called caucus. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. And it's being able to speak up in caucus, it's very important. Um, have things changed in the last number of years in caucuses, or do we, do people still have those down, drag them down, beat them up kind of fights as, that I've heard about in the past from uh, the Tory caucus for sure? Is that still happening? So I, I, don't, I don't Not know. there. Don't we know. don't know. I'm not there. <laughs> yeah, not I don't there. know. But I don't know about other caucuses. But all my life, I've heard about the Tories eating their own in terms of leadership, and I guess I lived through ten years of not eating their own so i i think maybe i'm a blip on this system uh, no lucky I don't man know. I, I i'll say this the, getting into politics is not for the faint of heart and you'll know dorothy that since confederation we've had a very small number of people who've been members of parliament or senators less than six thousand yeah. it's a very small club and pick up on paul's point it's a privilege to be a member of parliament and if you're privileged and 20,000 people checked off your name and have the courage of your convictions and stand up and say you disagree with something. When I hear people who cower in caucus, they're cowards, period. Yeah. Now, is that something you learned from hockey, how to take on an issue and how to confront it up front and not be a coward? I mean, it seems to me you have to take, have a lot of determination and grit to play hockey in the first place. Well, I, I was always the little, I was always the smallest guy on the team. So, if, and probably one of the yappiest. And I was, a, I wasn't a real great hockey player, but I was a fast enough skater. So they always wanted the big guys. Of course, everybody was big to, for me when playing against them. They kind of wanted to rub me out, especially body contact. But I held my own. I was a feisty little guy. And, and that's what you have to do because maybe you can't beat the big defenseman up but if he knows that you're not going to be intimidated by him and you'll stick it to him if you have to and fight your own battles they will grudgingly some of them give you the respect and give you space and I'm sure the other two feel the same way you just cannot be intimidated and in politics it's the same way you cannot be intimidated but I can't stress this enough. At the end of the day, you can stand up in caucus, and I did many times, and I know Paul did before he became the caucus chair, and we 
disagreed sometimes with some cabinet ministers, even the prime minister. And to tell you the truth, the prime minister of the day, Jean Chrétien, he liked it better because he was that a street fighter. As long as you were coherent and made, made sense to what you were saying, he liked that when someone would get up and other people would just sit back and mm -hmm. they just say nothing except so, complain about so it afterwards. So Dorothy, Paul de Villers and I play golf on a regular basis. And we also play with a guy by the name of Dick Moles, who's from yeah. Petawawa. And sure. he knows Heck. So you want to know how tough Heck is? Dick Moles says he's cleaned out a few bars in his life. <laughs> yeah, I had a big broom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about yeah, you? It, and 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 Hector and Dick Moan skate very similarly, so yeah. fast you can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, but he's six. He's six foot four, and I'm five yeah. foot four. Yeah, you're five but foot he's four. A great player. Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. I'm only a little shrimp. <laughs> but, but one one Are of my both? yeah. Go ahead. Oh, one sure. one of one of the things I'm most proud about is that I had. Uh, Prime Minister Krejci yelling at me three times in caucus. <laughs> he yeah, wasn't, yeah, like, yeah. wasn't liking right. what I was saying. He, he <laughs> tried to he'd say, "You sit down and be quiet. You're making you're making me mad." <laughs> He's right. I was there that day. I went. Oh, yeah. and then the VA came back up the second time, and then he got. I don't know who the caucus chair was the third time, and I thought you're going to get killed. But you know what? <laughs> the Prime Minister promoted Paul after that to be our Minister of Sports. And he took him golfing with him with Tiger Woods. Wow. That's right. Well, Kretzia loved Paul the VA because he might he's feisty actor. He's tough. Anyway, that's the way it goes. So, so Jack, just I want to bring it's not just because he was feisty, it's because he got respect by saying what he thought. Yeah. Absolutely. He's not, just, he's not just feisty about nothing. Ab There's you're feisty absolutely. about nothing. There's feisty you're about something. Yeah. Well, you don't get to be the caucus chair because you're a shrinking violet. They knew that if they came to Paul with an issue, Paul would put them on, even if Paul knew that it could be controversial. But Paul was very fair, but don't cross them. Then the hockey came out. Yeah, well, you're going to get it, buddy. You're going to get a cross check. But anyway, that's the, that's the way it works, for sure. Hey, Dorothy, this crossing business reminds me I was on the list to lead a delegation to Bulgaria. And uh, I was in Winnipeg and you know we had a lot of people and I was doing something really important. I forget what it was, but the, uh, the whip called and said, I had to go to Ottawa to make a vote. And so we were gonna win the vote to 11 to 32. And he really wanted me to be there for what reason. So I didn't go. So the next week I'm the Ex leader of the delegation to Bulgaria. <laughs> so this but, but, I, but I remember walking into his office and saying, uh, you, you should know something about me. What you did wasn't right and it wasn't fair. And we're going to get a chance to get even one day. And uh, mm -hmm. lo and behold, about uh, three months later, he did something and I pointed it out to the whole caucus. <laughs> and uh, and so he got it back, and, and I remember him saying to me, well, Leo, you know, that wasn't fair. And I said, fair comes in, two, in even numbers. The, right. third one, the third one is up to you, but first one right. was you, the second one was me. That's a, that's a hockey thing. By I way. was just going to say, that sounds like a hockey lesson, wouldn't you say, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Well, when, when I was in, in the uh, sex state for sport, uh, I was at the uh, through WADA. We had a lot of international dealings, and uh, we were at one of the WADA meetings. And the uh, European Union was amending their convention on on doping, and for some reason, Canada is a signatory to that, even though we're not part of Europe for whatever reason. So they asked us to sign on. So I looked at it and sent it back, and and the Foreign Affairs looked at it and they said, "Oh no, we can't sign that." So I looked at it again and. The three changes they were making, we were already doing. So I went ahead and signed it anyway. <laughs> uh, foreign Affairs ended up having the the ambassador who was who dealt with the European Union had it revoked. Really, my signature as the Secretary of State on the on the convention had it revoked. So Bill uh, Bill Graham was the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs at the time. So I brought it up with Bill and raised raised hell over it, but uh, you know, but that's the type of 
thing that, you know, it made absolutely no sense to not sign it. And, and the, the headline would have been, Canada doesn't sign, Canada not in favor of anti-doping. Yeah. yeah. When they, when they re 